Women's football first began to thrive in the 1920s and there were around 150 teams in England. The sport attracted huge crowds, sometimes even up to 50,000 people. Women's football matches were also played for charitable causes, raising thousands of pounds for hospitals and needy children. This was until the 5th of December in 1921 when the FA announced they were to ban women's football matches from all FA run grounds after they deemed the sport dangerous and unsuitable for women. It wasn't until 1993 that the FA began to support women's football again. But did the ban have an impact on women's football? And where does it leave women in the sport today? Women's football continues to grow in popularity, with more and more women and girls playing across the continent. In 2016, the number of registered female players playing competitively was recorded at over 1 million, while the number of semi-professional players had risen to over 2,800. However, it is no surprise that it is the big Premier League sides in men's football that attract the most amount of people. The highest ever attendance to Premier League match currently stands at 85,000. This is compared to women's football, which has an average of just 314 fans per match. The price of an annual season ticket for a top team in the Premier League can cost a fan up to £1,758. However, for a women's match, admission can be as little as £2 per game. Although it is evident that women's football still lags behind the men's game, this has not stopped young girls from continuing to engage in their favourite sport. Imogen is 17 years old and has high aspirations of becoming a professional footballer in the future. She has been playing football ever since she was just five years old and has continued to play and train regularly. Imogen visits her local football centre in Barking twice a week and the team she plays for, Barking Abbey, train and play matches at the weekends. As a young female footballer, I think that even though women's football is much more respected than it was 20 years ago, there's still a long way to go in women's football, getting the respect it does deserve. Uh, at school, when people say, like, what sport do you do, and I say football, you know, they just laugh in my face. They say, sure, you're not on the dance academy, sure, you don't do ballet with all the other girls. So people still make them comments and assume that women can't play. Obviously, men's football has a lot of coverage in the media, Sky Sports, I don't know, on the BBC match of the day on a Saturday night. Women's football is starting to catch up, though. We are seeing a lot more coverage that wasn't there before, such as the European Championships that recently happened. It was on BBC One and BBC Two when the women got to the later stages. And that definitely wouldn't have happened about 10 years ago, so that's really positive. Even though the attitudes of some of the public aren't um, as equal as we'd like them to be, we do now have role models that we can look up to as female footballers, such as Steph Houghton, who's the current England captain. People like that weren't really around when I was growing up in the mainstream media. I knew about players because I watched it, but my mates wouldn't have been able to name like, any England players, whereas now they can reel off a few names, which is really positive. I personally think that the ban put in place by the FL on women's football in the early 20th century has had a real negative effect on where the game is today. I think without that ban, we'd definitely be as big, if not bigger, than men's football at the minute. Coming up. We look deeper into the controversy involving Phil Neville, the new England's women's coach, and the sexist remarks he made on Twitter in 2012.